Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to today's edition of the Heidelberg Joint Astronomical Colloquium. It's great, those especially who have managed to make it down from Königstuhl today. I hope that the new bus link was helpful in this respect. And without further ado, I'm going to pass over to the host of today's speaker, Christiana Helling, who is Hans Ludwig. Hello, everybody from my side. Uh, a brief CV of our today's speaker, Professor Christiane Helling. She obtained her PhD in 1999 at the Technical University of Berlin. Berlin. Uh, I guess at the time you were already working on chemical things, I would say. No, so it doesn't say so here. Okay, uh, she stayed on for a while in Berlin, but then continued to the Netherlands worked in Leiden and Nordwijk at Estec, uh, continued then going north, Scotland, where she spent most of her time you know, being a reader. And finally, with a, bit, a little bit of back, back and forth, I couldn't fully make sense of it with the, the Netherlands, uh, but, uh, uh, becoming a full professor in St. Andrews. Um, Perhaps important, she uh, from 2016 to 21, uh, she uh, was director of the St. Andrews Center for Pla Exoplanetary Science. And I guess that was also one of the reasons why from 2021 on, she became director of the Austrian, now we are talking about Graz, Institute for Space Research, Graz, acronym IWF, um, and in parallel being also professor in uh, space research at the Graz University of Technology. Well, and with this, I hand over to Christiane. Welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Hans. Thank you for this very nice introduction. Now it sounds Sounds quite impressive, but it also has a lifelong devotion to astrophysics involved in it. So first of all, thank you so much for the invitation to give this colloquium today. And thank you so much for everyone who has been involved to orchestrate um, me today now being able to stay here and give this talk. So it was a bit of a experience, shall we call it. So my topic today, this is the wrong way around. My topic today is the different atmosphere regimes that characterize extrasolar planets, but what I want to do is to start to introduce you the institute that I'm leading right now, because if you have been at least to a fraction um, inherited to the my, my own ignorance for, for everything outside Scotland, you probably for everything outside uh, Germany. It, I'm not entirely sure how many people actually know about this, uh, the, the Space Research Institute of the Austin Academy of Science. So the Institute is actually building space qualified instruments that are flying at space missions that are built by the Sp European Space Agency and by the Japanese Space Agency, by the Korean Space Agency, what, what have you. So, and uh, most of these um, missions are of course in the solar system. We are all aware of what the solar system is, so I don't need to preach it to the choir. And most recently, um, the Institute also expanded toward ex towards exoplanet science and that's why I'm standing here today. So our institute has um, eight research groups, um, three of them working on exoplanetary science. So my own one, Luca Fusati, so we are doing weather and climate. Luca Fusati is doing exoplanet characterization and evolution, so mass loss stuff. And Peter Woidke, planet forming disks and astrochemistry. Then we have two um, of the previous research groups um, working on solar system science. Um, here, this is Helmut Lammers research group and people who have been working on um, exospheres, of planets may have encountered him. And then Rumi Nakamura's research group, she, she is an expert in space plasma, and they have a huge involvement in all the solar system um, missions that have to do something with, with uh, magnetic fields. And then the Institute also has three um, technology uh, groups, one doing onboard computers, one doing space magnetometers. One of our space magnetometers is right now on juice on the way to, um, to um, to no, uh, in, sorry, 
on the way to um, to Jupiter in order to study there how much water actually is in the icy moons. And then we also have a satellite laser ranging station, which is involved in uh, space deb debris, um, yeah, what measure measurements and um, yeah, safety in the end. Okay, so that's that's us. Sorry. Um, and I think it's it's wise to demonstrate in how many missions we actually are or will be involved with. So this this timeline is only starting in this century, and clearly this is all. Everything what you're seeing here on that slide is, of course, based on a heritage that goes much, much farther back in, in, in time. We are here at 2023, and here we have seen the launch of the JUICE mission. Um, there are, we have a quite high cadence of, of, mission, of launches that we are involved with. The next one, um, for example, is, is the Plato launch in 2026. Then we have Heliosworm. Then comes um, Comet Interceptor. Comet Interceptor will... Um, park at L2 and then jump onto, well, kind of jump, um, onto a yet to define uh, comet. So this is really something totally new. And then we have Ariel and now um, Athena, the next flagship mission, X-ray Observatory of the European Space Agency, is now on, on the way into phase A and we hope to be much more involved in that. And you may have heard that ESA has now down-selected their, their next M7 batch, yeah, M7 batch, so the medium-sized class missions and our institute is involved in two of the down selected ones so MRTs, MRTs would fly to Mars and the plasma observatory of course um, then studying the Earth's magnetosphere and you see um, the competence that our institute already reflected in here. All right I'm happy to talk more about this but I would actually advise you go to our web page and click on the on the movie that we made this is really truly impressive. So and now, of course, let's let's move over to what uh, to our research here. It's very clear that all the missions that we are flying, that we are involved with, can only study either the solar system or very narrow uh, volume around the solar system. I know I'm talking to astrophysicists, so I I keep it brief. Um, of course, other people who do high energy physics, they go farther. We are doing planetary science. We are stick close to to our um, to where we are belonging to. Nevertheless, this, of course, then um, shapes the science mission that we have, uh, scientific questions that we have at the Institute. And of course, there's nothing less than really studying and finding out the place of humanity in the universe. And that means we are looking at the diversity of planets and planetary systems. So why are they so diverse? Then why is Earth so unique? So why is Earth and the solar system so very much fine-tuned to, to life as we know this? And this very much goes into figuring out what the, what the difference between Venus and Mars is. So the, you see the, Mar the next Mars mission reflected here as well. And then, of course, the responsibility of humanity for planet Earth. And this we can go into many, many details. But one of the aspects for us is space ecology. And here we are talking about the laser ranging, the satellite laser ranging um, group. So at Graz, and you see I'm closing into my own topic now. At, at Graz, we have now three um, pillars that study exoplanets, so formation, climate, and evolution. Here we have the aster chemistry and planet forming disks. This is basically my research group. And then we have Luca Fusati's research group looking at atmospheric evolution through mass loss. And what I found really phenomenal here is that their models, the combination of star and planet evolution is now able um, to, um, to interpret, to explain the mass radius a relation of these giant gas planets. So I think that's that's quite remarkable. Each of our groups has to be linked to um, space missions. And I'm just giving you a couple of examples before I'm really talking now about my pet project. Um, for the disks, our disk people need to use a multi-instrument approach in order to construct the spectral energy distribution and other people have worked on this area as well. Then we, of course, we are uh, using our models to interpret um, JWST data. And here you see the see, uh, morning evening terminator asymmetry. I will come back to this later. But what is pretty remarkable here is the CUTE mission. And CUTE has enabled us or enables us to uh, determine the mass loss rates of, of exoplanets. I haven't, have, did I put? No, I can't say which one it is right now. And also to give us an idea of what the um, outermost exospheric uh, temperatures is. And this is important for us if we really want to model the chemistry and interpret what we see. So 
let me just oh yeah let me just move on now we can come back to this if you want so what i would like to talk about scientifically is how to characterize so my take basically on characterizing characterizing extrasolar planets and i think i'm taking two aspects here for me we have one very simple way there are the global parameters and there are the atmospheric um, details here I'm showing you a, a plot which actually comes from Heike Rauer's recent uh, Plato um, update, and we just have remade it for, for our purposes, where we have the planetary bike density and the planetary mass. And what you see here, here we have the super, uh, super Earth and mini Neptunes, and here we have the gas giants. And, and, and ideally, we would, we, would be, we would want to use global parameters in order to characterize any planet. So if you give me a temperature, a surface gravity, a radius, then I would like to be able to tell you, okay, you expect these molecules, you expect this cloud coverage, what have you. So that we have a clear, unique uh, correlation here. So, um, but we are not quite um, quite there, but what we, are, what we have as a community achieved is a, a certain amount of exoplanet characterization. This is the same, no, it's not the same plot. This is the same plot. This is the, sorry. This is the mass, and this is the radius. And here I am now showing you the surface gravity and the equilibrium temperature. And we can have a conversation about what the equilibrium temperature is, but I like to think of it as a global temperature. Some of us have seen retrieval approaches, retrieval interpretations, which give you a temperature of one thousand seven hundred fifty-three Kelvin. Interesting precision, I would say, but um, quite unbelievable. So, therefore, for me, you will always see will always see uh, rounded up to at least a hundred because I don't believe in that we can give the temperature of an exoplanet at a, uh, to a precision of one Kelvin. In this plot, we have here on the left hand side again uh, the Neptunes here, and then we have the warm Saturns, then we have the hot Jupiters, and then we have the ultra hot Jupiters. And what I would like now to do show you the respective atmospheric uh, yeah, regimes associated with this based on our simulations. So in order to gain a full picture of these planets, uh, we, we use, we utilize virtual laboratories in order to produce temperature maps from three-dimensional global circulations. And we aim to characterize the planets by a unique set of hopefully global parameters. Let's see how far we get. We do this um, by running, by solving hydrodynamics or radiation hydrodynamics, actually, so that we really have the um, the wind, yeah, the wind structure, the density structure, the pressure stru pressure structures. On top of this, we of course look for the gas phase chemistry, and what is our speciality here is, and what comes becomes has become um, increasingly more important over the last couple of years, is the cloud formation, and I will go into this in a in a little bit more detail. But the aspiration here is to really solve each of the necessary, each of the um, individual modeling um, parts in as best as we possibly can, which means we are really working hard to have here a fundamental, a, a, a huge amount of microphysics in order to really um, support our, our way of cloud formation modeling, for example. And all of us can, of course, make these points for for other complexes. Now I would like to have my next slide. There we go. So what is it? If you are talking about cloud formation, um, of course, I want to give you a bit of an idea. And some of you have seen some version of this of this um, a sketch at some point. So what is cloud formation? What we are actually thinking of is a box of gas, and we are cooling it down, and we observe how the chemistry changes. Just let's imagine we are putting our box of gas up here. It has a certain oh so we, here we have we have a some some idea about the temperature. So the temperature shall be co cold in the upper atmosphere or in the upper part, and it shall be warmer in the lower part. At the same point, at the same time, we have a lower density and a higher density. Okay, so in the upper part, there where it is cold, we have preferably the gas phase. Which is cold enough, so that, which is cold and dense enough, so that we have enough collisional processes going on, so that molecular clusters can form. At some point, these clusters are large enough, so that they hopefully become uh, solid particles, which we then call the cloud condensation nuclei. 
and here it's called nucleation, and these nucleation seeds are formed by gas-gas reactions. Now the fun starts, because the moment we have such a particle in a gas phase, many other materials can already be thermally stable, because it's cold and the densities are pretty high. But this means that everything that is already thermally stable we can, uh, starts to condense on the surface of these cloud condensation particles. And as we are talking astrophysics, there, is of course, there, there can be many, many materials so that we in exoplanets actually would expect not a homogeneous cloud particle, but a cloud particle made of various materials. Once they have actually already here up here formed, they start to gravitationally settle. They fall into the atmosphere. They are falling towards different, to, they are falling through different temperatures towards higher densities. That means this process of surface growth actually speeds up. And with that, the particles increase so that we not only have a chemistry, a chemistry gradient, but we also have a particle size gradient from small in the top and becoming bigger in the, uh, at the bottom. At some point, the temperature is high enough that it evaporates so that we would have an element enrichment in the lower part of the atmosphere. Can someone tell me why all of this is actually much easier for Earth? What do we have on Earth that we don't have on exoplanets? Well, this is not always a blessing. This may also be um, actually a, a trap because you to parametrize to death. Uh, so here we need to really think what what processes are involved. No one, no taker. I don't believe it. Yes, case re rescue me. Yes, thank you. You rescued me. So you could also have said a volcano, erupt a volcano eruption reaching up to eight kilometers into the atmosphere. Yes, exactly. So what we really don't have and what we cannot simply assume is that the presence of cloud condensation nuclei. So that means in exoplanet research, we always need to start to think what actually, how, how does the cloud formation start? And what we did over the last couple of years we actually have put a lot of effort in supporting this, this part of our model by uh, quantum chemical calculations for TiO2 and for vanadium oxide. But we also have a star. So the star, uh, in, uh, sorry, the, the, the star causes photochemical processes affecting the upper atmosphere. So we may have another source for cloud condensation, nuclei forming, raining from the, from the top. And then we can also think about ionization processes of uh, cloud particles, which become of interest in various ways. But we have conducted uh, laboratory experiments in order to see how cosmic rays potentially could ionize the cloud particles and how this would help to agglomerate cloud particles wherever that is possible. So. All of this um, then comes down to quite a set of equations, and I haven't um, I have I, ca I haven't given you the equations, but I can tell you, we are looking at twenty differential equations with with nine uh, in, on top of this to 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 um, take care for the mass conservation, and then of course we need to solve the background chemistry in order to do all this. And most recently, one of my one of my PhD students has actually included has enabled us to also look at coagulation processes. And what we did here, we combined a momentum with method with a bin method. So and for everyone who has a bit of an idea what momentum methods are and what bin methods are, this has been a no-go in the community for, for quite a while. So I'm pretty happy that we managed to do this. Right, let's move on to results. So we have from the 3D simulations, we have our, our temperature maps. And we need a temperature map in order to say something about the chemistry. Let's move back to the previous slide. Here we have a warm Saturn. And as this is as a warm sat as this is relatively cold, we have a somewhat homogeneous temperature distribution. Here we have a hot Jupiter. So the uh, object would always be uh, irradiated from your right hand side, so the, the host star sits on this side. Um, and we do begin to see a certain temperature asymmetry from the day to the night side. If we move over to ultra hot Jupiters, which would be that one, yeah, this is actually WASP 39b. Then we have an extreme temperature difference on the day, difference on the day and on the night side. So we are looking at, two, at the difference of about 2500 Kelvin. Can someone tell me what that means for the, for the wind speed? on these objects. And actually what I'm asking for, what is the driving force for this wind speed? 
educated answers. We all have done hydrodynamics, right? We all know the Navier-Stokes equations, don't we? Is that so simple? Yes, please. Oh, hey, uh, hello. <laughs> Yes, so the answer I'm looking for is the pressure gradient. <laughs> yes, okay. So that means as we have a huge temperature difference on the day and the night side, we have a huge temperature gradient from the day to the night side and which drives really huge uh, winds and in particular, yeah, jet-like uh, structures. But what I'm interested in is really the local temperature and pressure because what I'm interested in figuring out um, how clouds are forming and what they are doing. So... Remember I said for the warm Saturn, we had a relatively homogeneous temperature distribution. Well, and therefore we have a relatively homogeneous coverage of, it, of clouds. But you also see, what are we actually looking at? Yes, this is the, uh, this is the dust to gas ratio. This is basically the cloud mass load. Mass load. We will have still more, <coughs> more, more mass in clouds on the night side than on the day side. Here we have WASP 39B. And you see we have more of the clouds sitting deeper in, in the atmosphere, but there's also some a little bit of asymmetry. Um, it turns out to be quite, su uh, quite substantial. But where we really see the asymmetry nicely is in the ultra-hot Jupiters. And what I really would like, to, what, would, what, would like you to see is on this side, we, ba we barely have clouds. They are sitting very high in the atmosphere. But down here, the, um, the wind that comes or the... The wind that transports the hot air, the cold air, sorry, the cold air from the night side enables the cloud to really extend towards the day side much, much further than, of course, on the other side, where we have the hot air moving across the terminal, terminator regi region into the night side. So there is to be ex there is a very strong chemical and yeah, cloud distribution asymmetry. Yes. These Yes, these are these are tidy locked planets. That's right. Is that what you were asking? Oh, there are there. Are, oh, sorry. So the question I I thought the question was: Are they tidy locked? The answer is yes. They are tidy locked. That means the 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 uh yeah, it's a little bit the, the moon the moon Earth situation. And then the next question was: Are the wind speeds comparable to the um orbital? To the rotational speed, well, these wind speeds can can be supersonic. So then the answer is no. <laughs> Let me see. There is there is a question. The radial scale is, is exaggerated. So what I can tell you is that this is the this is basically the pressure. So here we have. Oh. Yes, this is this is one ten to the. Yes, 10 to the 2, 10 to the 2 bar, and up here we have 10 to the minus 4 bar. So in, we are, in this sense, we are exaggerating the extension of the atmosphere, yes. So this is, this is the everything we don't model. I think that's the right way of putting it, yeah. So what I would like to move on now, I'm picking out one particular planet. You already hopefully have spotted that this is was 39 b and here we would have something like heads 6b, and then you can use your favorite ultra hot Jupiter on, on the right hand side. Um, because it's actually quite uh, intriguing to have a closer look how the velocity field, for example, for, for, for a planet that I had perceived as pretty boring, um, does look. So head 6b, for me, it was a relatively homogeneous, in this sense, chemically pretty boring um, object. But it turns out, if you take it a, a closer look, it isn't, it's, it's far beyond boring. So here we have the temperature maps. Um, super And superimposed, we have the velocity maps. Here, the upper part is 10 to the minus 3 bar. So we are high in the atmosphere. And the lower plot is tend to is is in um, one order of magnitude deeper in the atmosphere on a pressure scale. So what you see is here we have a much more homogeneous temperature distribution than higher up in the atmosphere. And just to guide our eye, this is here the equatorial would be the equatorial plane. Here we would then have the morning terminator. Here we have the evening terminator, and here we have the substellar point. The substellar point is the point 
where the object receives the highest irradiation of the host star. And what we see is that, in fact, the part where the atmosphere is hottest is actually offset to the to your right. That means the material is transported faster than it actually can radiate, can, can, can get rid of the energy, right? So, but this also means that the morning and the evening terminator regimes, re regions are thermodynamically rather different. We would then expect that the evening terminator to be hotter than the morning terminator. And we would then expect to see this in some sort of transmission uh, spectrum, as we know it from JWST by now. So I shall say that this actually is uh, the work of a group of PhD students from, from the Chameleon, from our Chameleon network, which is a Marie Curie trainings network. And um, a year ago or so, I set them the, the task, use your joint expertise. One is doing the 3D simulations, one is doing the cloud simulation, one is doing the radiative transfer and analyze the object. And that's what they did. And what we see here is now the transmission spectrum on the top, uh, the transmission spectrum differences from the morning and the evening terminator. And here we see what we actually, what, what is hidden in the wriggles. The first thing is that we see the morning and the evening are indeed different. The second thing is that we see, this would be CO2, whatever, um, but that we also would have um, the, at, in the 10 micrometer feature, we would have the silica, silicate cloud features actually um, affecting the spectrum. Yes, I'm not showing it into too many more details because the students are still working on it. So you have to bear with it. Um, what I like with it is that we now have a model where we can go into the details and see basically at each point of the of, in the atmosphere what the chemistry is, what the cloud distribution is, what have you, what the local temperature, what the local thermodynamic and hydrodynamic fields may be. And now I'm trying this again. Oh, there we go. So the first thing is I'm showing here the evening and the morning terminator. And I have, let me just go back to this. And I have demonstrated that they are very different. This is the morning and this is the evening terminator and we are now drilling into the atmosphere and now look at what we can learn about temperature, pressure, cloud properties, chemical properties. So here's the morning and here's the evening terminator. We have expected the evening terminator to be hotter. This is the temperature, this is the pressure. You will see the pressure in a moment. So the black line here is the temperature at the evening. And this is the morning, this is also the black line. And what we see, as I anticipated, or as I told you, that the morning is colder than the evening. And this has ramifications for our chemistry. And here we have now the nucleation rate. It's beautifully invisible, the green one, but this is our total nucleation rate. And you see, if we have a colder environment, we have a higher number of cloud condensation nuclei forming than if you are moving to the hotter environment. Now, this, I'm sorry, this is the pressure. I have, I'm, showing, I'm showing you the complete figure in a, in a moment. I have cut it in order to over, overlay this, this, this plot. So yes, this is the pressure. And this would mean here we have, uh, let's just check, not that I'm, yes, okay. So we need to go back first. So here we are high up in the atmosphere. Here we are deep in the atmosphere. So let's let's uh, ponder on this a little bit. So here we have a high, uh, high number of, of cloud condensation nuclei forming. Here we have a low number of cloud condensation nuclei forming. Can someone tell me what that actually means for the size of the cloud particles? Let's first look at the younger people and then I turn back to those whom I would expect to know it. Shall I give out question cards in order to get you talking to me? One of my Thank you. <laughs> Let's see what we get. Let's see what we get. <laughs> so um 
now we can go and do exactly that exercise and have a look at the cloud particle size, which comes down here. So this is the same plot as before. Now we have it here, we have the gas temperature in, in black. Everything else is nucleation rate. If you go down, um, where we, this is the nucleation rate. If you go down here, we have in black, the mass load, the, the dust mass, the cloud mass load. Down here, we have the material composition and in black, our mean particle size. And here we have the pressure now. So low pressure, high pressure. Here's our evening terminator. This is our nucleation rate. Here's the mass load. And here we have our particle sizes. So you see if the, for the first, oh, this is, for, for, um, for a first glance, you see that high up in the atmosphere, the cloud particles are smaller and as they are falling inboard, they become, they increase in sizes. And they can become quite, high, uh, quite, quite big. So we have 10 to the four micrometers at the bottom, at the bottom of the cloud, just before they disappear and, and evaporate. At the top of the cloud, we would have about 10 to the minus two micrometers. And if you now look at this, at this plot, now you have to be really imaginary, you see that the cloud particles are smaller. That means if we have a higher degree of, uh, if we have a higher nucleation rate, the cloud particles will be smaller. Now we can talk about the material composition. This is this is also nice. So we can uh, we can see for this for these two uh, morning and evening terminators, the material composition of the cloud particles would be different. In orange, we would have silicates. In in br in, in brown, we have metal oxides. And you see that they make um, fifty and what about, and and forty percent um, of the total material. But up here, we have a more mixed. Uh, sorry, for the morning terminator, we would have a more mixed material composition. There is a lot of detail on this plot. I would like to leave it. Yes, I would like to leave it um, for now, but I'm happy to come back and answer questions about it because there, um, it may probably need a bit of digesting. But what I want to do, I'll give you the bottom line again. So we have the morning and the evening terminators. They have very different temperature profiles and the different temperature profiles become um, are caused by the strong day-night differences and by the off by the hot spot shift to the um, to your right, basically. So not it's it's not that the um, substellar point which re, which um, which gets the the largest amount of air radiation is the hottest part of the of the planet, but the hottest part of the planet is shifted away. This then causes already a temperature a temperature asymmetry between the morning and the evening terminator which then causes that the cloud formation is more efficient on the morning than in the evening terminator which then causes that we have bigger cloud particles on the morning than on the evening terminator and which then has ramic where are the cloud particles oh, yeah. um, which then has also ramifications for the for the material composition they have different material compositions on the morning and the evening terminator now how can we learn more about these clouds? Well, we have, there's of course JWST, but there's more that we actually can do. And my question was, how, how can we trace the asymmetries um, of our cloud, of, of our atmospheres uh, through scattered light? And here, this is, this is one of our um, postdocs, Katie Chubb has um, constructed us a, a code where we, which we can use to, to study the polarization of, of, of um, exoplanets. And here we have the star, and here we have the, our observer. So here this is basically the, the classical transmission situation. So this, the, the, the planet sits in front of the star and then it moves around. And now you can think of which of these phases are the most prominent for seeing scattered light. And this would be those, right? So we would see, um, we would easily observe, so hopefully, scattered light in the morning and in the evening, and then at these, at these two phases. Now, question was, would we see something or would we not? And here are the results. Here we have the reflected flux as function of wavelengths. And we are really only looking at scattered light. And we have now different constellations. So we have spherical symmetric particles. Yes, we have spherical symmetric particles, we have irregular particles, and we have a clear solution. So we look at an object which doesn't have any clouds, and then we look at an object which, ha which has clouds. These clouds can be spherical symmetric, boring, or they can be um, they can have a, a crystal structure, 
which we then call irregular. So let's first see what a clear atmosphere does. Well, this would be the, the, the scattered flux, and you then nicely see here the uh, NA and K uh, lines popping up. For us, it is of it was of course of interest to see what happens if the object has clouds, and you see that the scattered flux increases the more we move into the um, towards larger, larger wavelengths. And here we have a difference. Let's see. Yes, between the yes between the spherical and the non-spherical particles. Okay, all expected. In with view on. No, it's all of it. So it's Rayleigh and and me scattering. So the, sorry, the question was, uh, what kind of scattering it was, if it was only me scattering, and I, no, it's it's um, all of it. So, but what really my interest was to talk, to, to, to look at the degree of polarization, and the reason is, of course, that uh, H, HVO, so the Habitable World Observatory, um, and hopefully shall have a, a polar um, polar meter on it and we I have always been interested in seeing if you can get any information about our clouds out of polarization and of course we could um, and even more so we can learn about the differences of the day and the night side let's see if I can talk you to this plot so here we have the degree of polarization here we have the wavelengths here we are looking at our face on morning terminator in in um, dash dot. And here we're looking, where's my evening terminator? Oh yeah. And here we're looking at the evening terminator. And we can see that the degree of uh, polarization is, is considerably different. So that means uh, utilizing a polar polarized light will also enable us to distinguish the evening and the morning terminator. And even more so, we may learn something about the particle shape, which we haven't managed so far. I don't need another quarter of an hour, but okay. So what else can we utilize to, to learn about um, atmospheric regimes? And with that, about um, asymmetries in our gas giant planets? Well, there is the Plato mission coming up. And here, um, Dominic Samra has done the exercise to see that if we utilize red and the blue, I think it's by now called the green and the orange filter, uh, from 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 the plateau from the upcoming plateau mission, what if we can use that to learn something about the different the the um, asymmetries on the um, in the evening and the morning? And this is now for Hetz P seven B, and Hetz P seven B is one of the ultra hot Jupiters. I have given you the um, the temperature map up here. So this is again a difference of two thousand five hundred Kelvin. So we have extreme wind jets here. And here we have in orange, we have the transit depth for the morning terminator and in, in purple for the evening terminator. And here we have um, the blue and the, the red uh, photometric bands and you see one can very nicely distinguish both. And if we then move over to WASP-39b, everything is a little bit flatter, um, but we also can make the differences. We can, could make out the differences also here with, um, with the plateau. To, with the two color filters from Plato. Right. I would like to wrap up um, and make a couple of points about um, atmospheric regimes that we can use to characterize the diversity of exoplanets. You have seen these plots basically earlier. Of course, we can extend this to two more host star um, temperatures. Up here we have the uh, global temperature of our um, planet, so 800 Kelvin, 1600 Kelvin, 2400 planet, uh, Kelvin, and they are all calculated orbiting a, a, a G-type star. And if you think of this, of this, um, you get, of course, a colder object the further away you move from the star. That means the effect of the host star becomes less and less severe. Um, here we have, no, sorry, here we have our temperature maps, and here we have the maps of the cloud condensation nuclei. And we can now um, characterize them according to the cloud coverage, element depletion, mean molecular weight, and thermal ionization. So let's call this one, this category, for example, exocytron like. We would expect a rather homogeneous cloud coverage, but one has to take this with a grain of salt because we I just I just have demonstrated to you that we actually 
do already see differences between the ter uh, evening and the morning terminator. The element depletion that we should expect in the cloud affected regime of the atmosphere would seemingly be, uh, would, would similarly be um, also very homogeneous. So that means you have the depletion everywhere. And the mean molecular weight is also homogeneous. So we wouldn't see a difference or we wouldn't expect a chemically driven um, geometric asymmetry between uh, the day and the night side. And the thermal ionization is low. The hot Jupiters are somewhere in between and we can make cases about this. And then we have the ultra hot Jupiter. So where we have the cloud coverage only on the night side and a bit on the day side, or a bit on the uh, moving from the night to the day in the morning terminator regime. The element depletion would therefore only occur on the on the night side. So none of them, none of the element depletion should be visible on the day side. So whatever we measure on the day side should actually be the original element abundance of the of the atmosphere of its present evolutionary state, I should say. Which which then also means that we would have, especially for the, for the ultra hot Jupiter Jupiters, a difference of the mean molecular molecular weight between the day and the night side which means that the day side would be more extended, geometrically more extended than the night side. If we dissociate H2 or the other way around, if H2 cannot be thermally stable on the day side. But this has implications for the thermal ionization or for any kind of ionization. And here we are now really going out of what, out of the modeling framework I just have presented here. The thermal ionization is, of course, much higher on the day side in the ultra hot Jupiter than on the night side. And if you take this further and think how photochemistry actually affects the upper atmosphere, that would then imply that we have to consider that the day side of any of these ultra hot Jupiters has quite a potential for magnetic coupling, which then emphasizes the asymmetries that we, the geometrical, sorry, the geometrical asymmetries that we should expect for these kind of objects, which then means that using ultra hot Jupiters is actually a perfect, these are perfect candid candidates for studying all sorts of chemical regimes or physical regimes in exoplanet, in exo, uh, on exoplanets. Right. And this brings me to my and you have to my last slide, I will finish with this. So we all have seen the nature paper um, for, for WASP 107b, I assume. And what we are seeing here is the, well, that's the, uh, the transit depth basically. And here we have the wavelengths. Here we have the, what is it? It's the low resolution MIRI transit, transit spectrum. The global uh, temperature of, of the object has been um, established to be 700 Kelvin, and to my standards, that means that we have that we are looking at a planet which is pretty covered in cloud particles. So, and what we, what the uh, paper said, sorry, what the paper suggested is that we have some sort of, or they they concluded they have SiO2 clouds. That's fantastic because it's one of the two, no, one of the three direct observations of clouds in exoplanet um, atmospheres. But this, of course, has important ramifications for our for our modeling, because for the first time, we are now able to actually ask ask not answer ask the question: Do we see the uh, sorry? Do we see the SiO two cloud particles because of an efficient mixing, or do we see the the SiO two cloud particles because of a very distinct chemistry that really goes um, to study the surface reactions that take place in order to grow cloud particles from a complex chemistry. So what I'm saying here is, is for example, the, the surface growth of, of um, iron oxide suppressed because it has a lesser probability to grow and SiO2 is growing much more efficient or is it a mixing? So with this, um, non-resolution to, 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 to the observations. I leave you and I'm taking your questions. Well, thank you very much, Christian. That is really mind-boggling, literally mind-boggling what, what you can predict and calculate. I'm sure there's lots of questions. 
We just have one microphone, so I'm going to. Yeah. Okay. Well, the trouble is the Zo the Zoom people won't be able to hear, so we need two, two microphones. However, um, I'll give you this one, and I'll, I'll I'll make use of the other one. Okay. Okay. So, first question, please. Okay. Okay. So, handle with care. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Christiana, for the very nice talk. Um, so you've looked at the uh, ultra hot Jupiters, um, but this is like looking at the planetary population overall. This is a small fraction of all the planets that we're finding. And I'm wondering, can you say a little bit about uh, what you think the situation is going to be like for smaller um, planets? I mean, obviously, they won't have extended atmospheres. To what extent will we be able to uh, characterize those as well as we can? For such big planets, well, what what we what we need to change, or what we are working to change, is basically the background chemistry, right? And so, if you and and one of the one of the beautiful things is now that we really can can draw on the on the knowledge from the solar system, right? Uranus chemistry, and I just have a PhD student doing exactly that. We want to use our tools to see how far we get towards Uranus. So if we manage this, then we have understood where our limits are. And this also means that we know what we have to further develop. So what I'm basically saying is, yes, um, if we are going to the majority of the planets, we need cooler chemistries. Um, but the, the processes, the, the physics behind this remains the same. So my, 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 edu no, my, my not educated, but my knowledge will guess is we get we notice we have we have much more much more of those just with different chemistries and which more with, with more extended atmospheres. Does it kind of explain it? Uh, answer it. To, to some extent, I mean, I, I guess you have other activities as you mentioned before. I mean, you, if you have a solid uh, surface on the smaller planets, I mean, there might be if you have also if you include plate tectonics as well, you might have uh, outgassing and other other kind of uh, processes going on and reaching uh, these atmospheres. It's a more complicated uh, process, and it's much harder, I guess, to detect than uh, than what we have with the with the larger plants, with, where they have more homogeneous kind of uh, atmospheric structures. Uh, that would be my impression, but I don't know. I mean, you're the expert, maybe. Well, there is there is one one other aspect, right? Is is the is the deep atmosphere, which we are only beginning to understand actually how important it is to where we set the inner boundary or the other way around, how deep the mixing actually reaches. So that means we are really can dredge up um, a material from where it hasn't been affected by any um, clouds yet, so to say. So yeah, there's a lot to learn. Okay, another question from Keith Tullibund. Yeah, I, I hope I understand it correctly, because if you have um, these particles nucleating and then condensing out, they, they drop out of the atmosphere into, and then they start eva evaporating again, I guess, because they they get hot. But then you need indeed mixing to get them back up into the atmosphere. Um, what is now the driving force of the mixing? Is that the convection or is that the differential rotating or differential rotation that causes Kelvin Helmholtz or something like that? The question is now what the question is. So if you are talking about the physical processes, um, then we have various, right? We have we have convective, um, convective mixing. Then we have double convective zones, if you think about uh, Uranus. And then we have also diffusion. So, and now, but to answer your first question, um, yes, particles fall down, but it depends on, on their size, how, how fast they fall down, and if they may uh, be shifted a little bit to the right or to the left. But what is the most important is the local thermodynamics. The potential shifting it to the over next cell in my in my computational grid doesn't matter too much, and I think this is what we very beautifully actually see uh, see here. Um, so, in order to answer if the cloud particles are moving with the with the advection, one really has to do that with uh, with the with the with frictional coupling involved, and we have looked at the time scale, so all should be should be good. So. Um, then the mixing. Now modeling the mixing is yet a completely different animal. Because here we now have, or so we need to look at the two different chemistries that we have involved. 
So if you think about the kinetic gas phase chemistry, there is a lot where the diffusion actually matters. But for the for the clouds, we also have done uh, have looked at diffusive diffusive transport. Things, of course, can also matter. But in the end, we would want to really couple it to our three D three D atmosphere so that we are not parametrizing um, any vertical transport really, but work uh, really calculated in you know, in situ is, is a strong word calculated with the hydrodynamics. So right now I'm I'm mildly amused by the by the parametrization that is floating to the um, uh, to the literature in particular if you're thinking that people are basically parametrizing the vertical mixing by one um, um, diffusion hydrodynamic it's even a hydrodynamic diffusion constant so there is a lot to be done. Uh, Hans Lubeck. Ms. Janne, you challenged us with the test question during your lecture and asked about the driving force that drives this thermal winds around the planet. Something that bugged me always is a question. Neptune in our solar system shows obscenely high wind speeds up to Mach 4, to my knowledge. Insulation is not very high out there in the solar system. Could you explain to me how these large velocities can I have driven. no idea, but I will go back to the experts in my institute. Now I will go back to the people who have been working a lot with Neptune and, and Uranus mm -hmm. and ask them exactly the same question. Yeah. Are they really so high? Yes. It's... Now the question is at what at what level? Uh, well, well, what can one can observe from the outside? What yeah. has been looking at, yeah. I guess, okay. uh, motions of clouds in the atmosphere, whatever you are looking at there in terms of pressure, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I found it always very surprising that uh, this can be sustained. In... Yeah, oh, yeah. I, I agree. Okay. But now the, the question is now what is one what is one observing? So this is why I find this this um this head six B plot actually quite illuminating, that one. So here we are looking high in the atmosphere or high air in the atmosphere, and we see a much hotter. Uh, temperature. So now I can't tell you what the what the velocities are. Maybe they are also higher. I haven't done my homework here. So depending on where we are, if we move higher in the atmosphere, so things seem to become slightly yeah. more extreme, which also makes sense because the deeper we are, the more um, the denser the, the environment are is. That means the, the higher the, the local viscosity is. So everything basically gets every motion gets damped. So therefore, I'm not too surprised that things, or obviously I'm not too surprised, that things become more extreme higher up in the air. Thank you. Okay, a couple of questions on the other side of the hall. First, Ralph Kressen. Christiane, thanks. Very, very nice. Really cool stuff. I'm wondering about evaporation of the atmosphere, in particular in the case of the very hot Jupiters, in particular also if they are magnetically coupled to, let's say, the magnetic field of the, okay, of the star. Um, isn't this something um, that can become relevant? You may lose a certain fraction. You certainly would change the chemical composition uh, beyond just looking at differences in the mean molecular weight and so on. So we, we already know that the atmospheres evaporate, right? Luca Fusati's group has, has done quite some work on, on measuring mass loss and stuff. But the time scales that are involved are, are relevant for, for planetary evolution, but not so much for, for the for the local chemistry. So everything we are looking at right now is 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 the instant that we are looking at at the chemistry, but I do agree. Over the over the time, you're basically losing the hydrogen, whatever gets gets lost at the time. For the for the um, magnetic coupling, yeah. But what we also see is that also the the magnetic field basically confines, um, con protects the atmosphere and confines the atmosphere to a certain extent. Only if we have open magnetic field lines, we would lose things. And that is what, what now very nicely links back to the solar system um, studies that many people are doing. 
however we do see, I mean, if, and if we go to the solar system, to the solar system rocky planets for, for sake of, of examples right now, we see that Mercury doesn't have, have a magnetic field or it has a, just a, a mildly induced magnetic field. This means that it, it, lo it loses a lot. It, ha it has an, an exosphere. And Helmut Lama is, is just preparing fantastic papers about exactly about this. So the magnetic field plays plays a huge role. And if we move further towards outwards towards Mars, again, there is there is no mag mag uh, magnetic field left. Hence, the, the, the mass loss is ongoing despite um, being so far away from, from the host star. Yeah, our next step needs to be to, to look into the coupling to the magnetic field. But the problem here is, of course, we have, well, we have some clue that it must be larger than the um, than, than Jupiter's magnetic field. But we do not have any clue, for example, about how long the magnetic field perseveres. So why did Mars lose its magnetic field? Why did Mercury lose? It's not a it's not a giant gas planet. I'm I'm fully aware of this, but I think these are fundamental um, um, questions we really haven't haven't solved. But we can be pretty sure that our gas giants probably you know, have have a magnetic field, and we need to have we need to work out a couple of fingerprints to actually chase the magnetic field down. And I think the ions that we are after may help us. Okay, thank you. Um, one last question. I th oh, we have a couple of more questions. One on the um, Zoom audience, but there's one more on the, uh, right here in the audience. Please go ahead. Thanks. Hey, Christiana. Always great to hear more about clouds. You mentioned that your group is involved doing some lab experiments, and I guess my question here is, to what extent are the models limited by our understanding of the fundamental measurements of the cloud properties, whether it's nucleation rates or things like that, and how much uncertainty is there in the models then due to these lab measurements? So the question was, um, how would I want to improve our models by conducting more lab measurements? Is that about right? <laughs> okay, let's move back to that one. No, the question was how, how the models are limited by um, missing knowledge that could be supplemented through lab experiments. So initially I thought solving the nucleation problem is essential for us to understand cloud formation. And at some point I came to realize the moment we are relatively confident in how to model the nucleation problem, we, we won. Because it doesn't matter who produces the what produces the the cloud condensation nuclei as long as they are there. And now, of course, we are dancing around numbers here. And let's stick with the thought for a moment. Because, and the reason for for the relatively unimportance of what exactly drives the cloud condensation nuclei nucle, nucleation is actually that the material that goes into forming the nuclei will also go to form the bulk. That means there is a competition, and that's why we need to solve the mass, uh, the mass conservation equations for the elements. There is a competition between the surface growth and the, the formation of our beautiful uh, clusters here. The moment the surface growth sets in, the, the, the clusters basically lost, because surface growth is energetically much more favorable than any of these gas phase, uh, gas phase solid transitions that really have to step by step from the next more complex thing. So nevertheless, we have proven this again and again and again. Nevertheless, if we are moving um, throughout the galaxy, if we are looking at different chemical compositions, we need to be able to model what, how, the, how the cloud condensation nuclei form. So therefore, from my perspective, I would like to have a repertoire of things that would be possible. So therefore, I will put more effort in, in really understanding this. What really meant, what what really bug, bugs me is actually the surface growth. This one here, which I have, uh, which is, looks a bit colorful, because what we are doing, we have to write down each of the chemical reactions which creates a unit of that particular solid, like like Mg two S I O four, huge, big, chemically big. But we need to know which reactions actually would be possible, and we do not know this. I once undertook the entertaining um, exercise to go through the literature and see which surface reactions actually had been measured for SiO2. I think I found five. 
and for 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 five different for for three different papers, everyone had a different probability. So yes, there is we we need we need we need input, but we also ask need to ask these questions very wisely because it's a huge amount it's a huge laboratory effort to really produce this data. So. Um, yeah, I think it was a long winding answer with yes, we need laboratory data, but we need to be careful what we are asking for. Okay, thank you. So one last question to finish from Maria Bergman, which I will read out. Maria Bergman in the virtual audience, which I'm going to read out. Question to Christiana regarding testing cloud models. To what extent can models be tested using observations of the solar system planets versus exoplanets. Can exoplanet data be superior to, for example, observations of Jupiter's clouds? Hello, hello. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, and um, difficult question. I think we have tried to, to, uh, to use the solar system cloud observations again and again. And here we are coming back, I think I've made this um, beautiful remark that we have so many so many data for the solar system that things can be retrieved um, to, to a very large degree, which, which basically tells us things are there, but not necessarily how they have formed. So difficult, difficult to answer. But as I said, what, what we just want to do is um, use our modeling approach and try to, to move our way to Uranus clouds because this is a relatively, um, it's, it's a very sparse chemical regime and maybe this is the way to, to, to go. So I have no good answer for this, to be honest, because we can't use the particle sizes, we can't use the chemistry, we cannot use this, the particle size distribution, nor can we use the, the radiate, radiation impact. So we are a bit screwed in this, in this comparison, unless someone has a great idea. Um, so I think that's the end of the announcement. So it just remains for me to thank Christiana again for coming and telling us all this very exciting research. As always, we wish you very much success in the future in these very interesting enterprise. Thank you very much. Thank you.